Hello, and welcome to Maximal Fire. I'm Alex. And I'm Johnny. And today we're going to be talking about the competitive gaming scene within Adeptus Titanicus. So, Johnny, we're back to the pre-recorded formats of this podcast. We had a little bit of an experiment um, a couple of weeks ago uh, with a live version of this, which yeah. uh, was quite good fun, wasn't it? It was, it was good. Um, definitely really hard to talk and also do all of the uh, OBS stuff that you have to do with the, the live sessions. Yeah, I think you did a um, sterling job on that. Obviously, I couldn't see what you were doing at the time, but I, when I watched the stream back afterwards, um, yeah, very impressive, mate. Well done, um, especially because we didn't really have... It was kind of a little bit of a flying by the seat of our pants um, idea. Mm. I think it was like the night before or something. It was like, let's do a stream. And then... Yeah. I, <laughs> Cue to me, sweating, quickly putting t- scenes together in OBS. Yeah. It, um, <laughs> but yeah, no, if you have um, if you don't know what we're talking about, it's because uh, we put that episode um, up only on YouTube. So uh, that's not actually available on the regular Spotify um, or Apple podcasts uh, format. Um, it was a live chat that we did um, in our kind of more sort of relaxed... Um, yeah. Reactor yeah. chat, we're calling it, aren't we? Kind of like where yeah. we sort of react to the news. And that one was, it was quite focused around sort of the, the epic reveal. Um, I know there's a lot of people who say it's not coming. I, I look forward to being able to say, we told you so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was great. We had a surprising amount of people in the chat, actually, much more yeah. than we were, I think we were kind of expecting to be those guys with like, two dudes who are like waving the flag yeah 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 no i was i was really uh yeah quite excited how many how many guys tuned in and girls um oh man yeah it felt it felt good it felt really good it felt very natural um obviously when technical difficulties hit it's a little bit choppy and you yeah know, but we only uh only had one bit there so no it was all it was good i enjoyed it i think it was um definitely something we want to do again in the future at some point yeah i think it's a really good it works really well for kind of getting that immediate news out of there when we've got like a new release or something like that so i think Mm. we will certainly kind of look at that being like a bit of a format to get our kind of opinions immediately out there where something cool drops or something interesting drops so do keep an eye out for like um announcements of that join in the live chat um sort of give us the a bit of encouragement uh, to do it um it's the second time we've done a stream actually but uh but this is the more traditional format so we've still got loads of ideas uh, of things that we want to do but unfortunately i think it's fair to say work is kicking both of our asses at the moment um yeah, so the, the content has scaled back a little bit it's also um if you are in the uk um and you've been on like the at facebook page you'll probably know that there is a ton of events going on at the moment i think ever since beachhead in february through to kind of july it's like every other weekend there's an event and we try yeah. and and kind of participate in as many of those as possible to kind of you know keep in with the community um so there was obviously beachhead in february then we did the the maximal fire meetup at warhammer world at the end of april and then a couple of weeks ago i was in swansea for swansea comic con or swan con uh, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then in a couple of weeks' time from now, I'm up in Newcastle for their... Um, I forget the name that they've called the uh, th- their event. Uh, it's another, uh... another tournament up in Newcastle. Um, and then it's our own event uh, on the 8th of July in Entoyment in Pool. Um, oh, yeah, baby. Which is going to be kind of like, you know, here's, here's our smooth... Um, sort of plug there's still tickets available for that and we will put (laughs) details in the description um if you are interested uh tickets are available through eventbrite um and that's going to be a 1751 day tournament so we had a bit of feedback from a few people like 
these two day uh, things were great, but I think we veteran gamers kind of sometimes struggle to kind of get time away from families or jobs and that kind of stuff. And there Real was, life, yeah. yeah, there was a few people who wanted to participate, but couldn't commit to a two day. So we thought we'll try and cater for both. So we'll have our two, our big two day in beachhead at the beginning of the year. And we'll try and do at yeah. least one um, single day. So maximal fire four, um, because I've run out of interesting names to call it. And I think Die Hard was just Die Hard 4, wasn't it? Or was that... Was that no, that was... Uh, what was that? Die... Die Hard. Die Harder. Die Hard with a Vengeance. Vengeance. Die Hardest. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> wasn't Die Hard 4 the, like, hacker one, right? That was like this hacker yeah. dude. That it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, God, those, was was yeah. that Live Hard and... Uh, uh, um, live Fast and Die Hard, or, or it was something... Yeah. lame like that uh, but we think we milked the kind of diehards um, reactor meltdown with a vengeance I think it was last mm. summer I think we've done that I think that, I think we've done with that so we're just up to plain old boring maximal fire t- four um, although it's People actually with a new, uh... <laughs> we, we do um, we, we could maybe go with the aliens theme this one could be called maximal fire the next one could be called maximal fires and then the one after that, Maximal Fire maximal 3. Fire 3, and then Maximal Resurrection. Yeah. yeah. Or maximal Fire yeah, Resurrection. Why not? Yeah. So, although this is <laughs> our four, this is Maximal Fire 4, it's actually our, going to be our sixth event that we've run, uh, including Beachhead, which we kind of keep a little bit separate from that. Okay. So, um, hear, hear me out. If then we went on to the Alien versus Predator movies, where it would be Maximal Fire versus. Who would the versus be? Oh, I think it has to be our old Nemesis's um, tabletop standard, Nemesis, probably. Nemesis. Oh, yeah, Nemesis. Yeah, I think I think okay. we're overdue. Um, either getting Chris and the guys on one of our bat reps, or us going <laughs> back on now that he's done up his garage um, to kind of replay that game that me and um, Ben played with them. When was that? Like two years ago, I think mm. it was the last time that we did it, which was good fun. Um, but yeah, prob- probably going to be tabletop standard, I would say. Oh yeah. Should we just get some admin out of the way before we try and move on to the main content? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, so we'll start with the patron shout outs. So um, obviously if you sign up to be a patron of Maximal Fire, um, as well as various benefits that you can get, like access to a, a free SDL or a... Um, uh, a discount code for Battle Bling. Um, everybody gets a shout out on this show. Um, so since we did the last one, which would have been the live show where we did our last load of um, shout outs, we've had. Um, Want to give a shout out to Roland Lucas, Metalhead, Metalhead. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and Doug Hell Chamberlain. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much, guys. Um, if you've signed up to um, get a shout out and you don't remember hearing it, chances are I think we probably covered it in the live stream. So yeah, um, maybe go check that out. Um, but we also add all of our patrons to our credits at the end as well. So really appreciate everybody um, supporting the show. Uh, I think I think actually we are at like two years now of Patreon um, for Maximal Fire, which is amazing. And some people Insane. have been backing us since day one. So... I think I need to find out a list of those people and find a way to say thank you to them. Um, But yeah, um, on the subject of Battle Bling as well, um, we've recently got access to an affiliate link and the details will be in the description. Um, Every time you use that uh, link when you are um, purchasing stuff from Battle Bling, the show will get a small kickback um, of of whatever it is that you, you buy. So if... You don't. You still want to support the show, but you don't necessarily want to sort of sign up to Patreon, which you can back from as little as a pound if you want to. Um, then that's another great way that you can help support us. So I think the last bit of news I promised um, Greg uh, from Smells Like uh, Machine Spirit uh, that I would do a little shout out for him. Uh, so he's got a, a an event in um, in Washington. In, uh, in Bellevue on the 16th of September. Um, that is the Fall Brawl, 
um, tournament. So great to see like the American uh, tournament scene um, sort of getting. I'm sure there's more of this going on. It's just uh, pe- people don't tell me, so I don't plug it. <laughs> um, but yes, if you are in um, in Washington, it's going to be held at Mox Bellevue um, in Bellevue in uh, in Washington on Saturday the 16th of September. So uh, have a look on the Facebook. Uh, 2018 page um, also the Horus Heresy and 80 events page on Facebook or you can also join our Discord server and all of this information is in our 80 events um, channel and we also actually have events set up as like little calendar reminders um, in the top of our server oh yeah 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 so like, like like we were saying it very much is tournament season at the moment um I went to Swansea a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was the first time that um, I've been allowed out on my own without my family or my small child and having no family responsibilities for a long time. Um, it was um, run by Dougie Douglas, also known as the Viscount of Swansea. Um, and he did a great job and he also massively looked out for us. I think he used his mafia connections to get us some... Oh, yeah good sort of um, deals with rooms in hotels and stuff and uh, to kind of kick things off as well. It was Eurovision night. So we uh, not only did we kind of drink a lot, but we also got to enjoy a little bit of Eurovision. Like it or not, it's a bit of a dirty secret. Not, not dirty. What, what, what's the, what am I thinking? I'm not a dirty secret. Uh, a, uh, guilty pleasure. Guilty pleasure. Yes, a bit yeah. of a guilty pleasure for me is the old... Uh, although we did appalling this year, which is... Um, yeah... It is what it is. Back to normal in the in Eurovision <laughs> uh, for, for the UK. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah, and then last weekend was um, the Twisted Titanicus doubles event as well, which I think I think that's the first doubles event that I've been aware of um, in the UK. Um, I don't know if other, it's been done anywhere else, um, but um, Jim wanted to kind of give the new doubles. Um, matched play rules ago from the mm. um from the new match play guide so uh that sounds like that was a lot of fun um mm. and, and yeah unfortunately i couldn't make that one because I thought it would have been a bit much and i already burnt a lot of wife points <laughs> uh, you just don't generate them quick enough mate yeah I, I i need to do something i think i need to do something epic to kind of then I'm just very lucky that I've got an incredibly tolerant wife who puts up with my bullshit because, yeah, there's there's a lot of people um, who who probably aren't as as tolerant as she is, but um, but yeah, no, SwanCon was great. Um, it was um, two days, four day, uh, four games over two days, so it was a really chilled out, relaxed game. Didn't really start until ten o'clock. Two days, uh, two games on the first day, two games on the second day. Two thousand points, match play um, rules, and uh, yeah, played four great games of Titanicus. Um, it was hard, hard. <laughs> I, I and especially kind of like on the second day where we'd had a night of drinking. Like trying to get the brain to work was was even harder. Mm. But um, yeah, I, I played against um, three people who I've never played before, um, and that was um, Sarah, who's actually one of our mods on uh, Discord. Never played her before, despite the fact I've known her for about eighteen months. Um, played against her lovely Venator. I got to play against um, Dan from Bottom of the Barrel. Um, Check out their battle reports if you haven't heard of those guys. Do some excellent AT content. Mm-hmm. Um, and his Vulturum. Um, I played against um, Ollie, who's um, who's actually one of our patrons. Um, and he had some lovely painted Osadax. And finally, I played a Knight Household from John Horsham of, of Battle Bling. And every game, it was just like it was it was hard like i've been to a few tournaments before and like sometimes things just sort of happen naturally for you 
um and you can kind of just go with it you know throw some dice oh look i've won yay um but i had to work so damn hard <laughs> i won my first three games um the game against dan stupidly close um i think I, I only won by a handful of points to take that one um and then the game against um um ollie was the same um literally there was maybe five five or six points if i remember rightly uh, and he really put me through my paces on that one i i lost a a warhound first turn and through my when own fault start? yeah for my own fault I, I i wanted to um i needed to move to a piece of cover so i pushed that warhound's reactor and of course double heat so his shields immediately collapse um because i rolled like I think it was a four or a five or something, um, and uh, and then yeah, the, it it kind of from there on in, I was just constantly on the back foot, and and really, yeah. really, Ollie should have won that game. Um, I think that one I only won because I played a score to settle at the tertiary objective, uh, which bumped up my um, secondaries and and ultimately mm-hmm. gave me the win. Um, and my final g- game of the weekend, I lost to John. Uh, from Battle Bling, that was against the Knight Household, which are tough to beat. Um, they sound like actual hell. They, yeah, um, they they were really hard. Um, and he had the House Indra ability, which allows you for it's a three point stratagem allows you to bring on a destroyed banner again. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I know knights, yay. Um, so, so at the end of the game, um, I, I I held back. I had uh, one of my um, princeps, and I'd taken um, a primary and secondary combination, which was push forwards and I think it was deny them, uh, which means that your prince, two models have to survive until the end of the game. One of them's a prince. If one of them's a princeps, um, it's like nine points. Um, and push forwards, which um, you have to be within a certain distance of the table edge and i took tempestus so i held on to this guy basically until turn four and then drop potted him right behind john's lines um i lost everything apart from that one um um that one warhound princeps um john had one serastus knight left um, and that one Serastus Knight had one structure point left on it. Oh, my God, no. And he had the same as me, push forwards. So, um, yeah, basically, he scored more in his secondary than I did. But if I'd have just done one more nine-up structure point, oh. um, I would have won the game. Um, but that, that's that's how I, I find most games with Knights go. Like... I played against um, James McMeekin um, at the second reactor meltdown tournament, and I played against his knights. And in the end, I just beat him because I, on the last dice roll of the game, I needed a five up to hit with a melter gun, and it went my way. Nice. So, like, it's it's always whenever I play them, it's always super clutch, always clutch. Um, so that was a shame. I think I was on on uh, track to go second. If I'd have beaten John, I would have finished second. As it turned out, I came fourth. Just missed out on placement. Ooh. Just really tight in the t- uh, t- tight in the top three. Um, but yeah, um, I still walked away with best painted though for my Tempestus. So I was super happy to come back with uh, with something. I don't know if my oh, I've hidden my trophy at the back there. He's behind. Mr. Buggerlogs, <laughs> so I'm not going to go grab him. But um, yeah, it was it was a great great um, event, and Swansea is a beautiful city. I've never been there before. Um, I think about half of the people at that tournament actually turned out to be patrons or close to it, which was amazing. Yeah, guys. I, yeah, it's nice. all, it's always good to to see everybody and kind of like shake hands and actually meet patrons who I've not seen before. So. Um, yeah, it was awesome. I think I'd definitely go back again, especially if we can get in at that hotel, because it was awesome. Um, and their cocktails were epic. Um, yeah. But yeah, so that that was Swansea. So now I, I'm prepping for Newcastle in a couple of weeks' time. I'm going to take my Graphonicus to this one, do something a little bit different. Um, mostly because 
um, Newcastle's 1750, and I spent the first three months building my seven, uh, my 2K list for Swansea. Um, I'm like, I'm not going to re like paint another reefer or something in two weeks mm. um, to like change it to a a 1750. But um, tournament season well and truly kind of in the flow, which is why I guess we thought we would do this little bit of a, a bit. Perfect timing, eh? Yeah, about about competitive gaming. Um, so I'm not, although I go to a lot of tournaments, it's mostly so I can see people. Oh, I'm just hitting my mic. Um, I, I'm not what I would call a competitive gamer, but I guess if you've ever played against me, you might think like otherwise. Perfect. Don't lie to yourself. Um, <laughs> I think it's you know I I I cut my teeth on AT playing against Ben, who's like one of the best AT players I've ever played against, and George as well, who's the same. Mm-hmm. Both of them together are really tough opponents. So learns a lot from them. And uh, it's, it, I am very happy to say that uh, Ben is returning to playing AT again. So he's going to be um, at the um, tournament in July. Um, got played a game against him, actually. Um, I bought... I've got more Titans for my cabinet now. Um, I bought... Have a problem. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> I really do. I bought um, a really nicely painted Furion's Maniple um, from... Uh, well, it's more than a Maniple, but uh, Battle Force from Stu Oliver. And um, the first time that they got a run-in was Ben borrowed those to, to play a game with me against my Tempestus and yeah I still don't like Furians they're bloody awful in a in a in a good way like they hurt so much like hunting or specs man Jesus um and that game came down to us both getting a bit of a bloodlust and just shouting engine kill and forgetting all about our objectives and Ben beat me five victory points to nil that's how much we <laughs> We cared about our primaries and secondaries. So damn close. Yeah, it was it was good fun though. It was good fun. Um but yeah, there is there is a side of AT which um some people may not have kind of gotten involved in. So AT is naturally I guess you call it a narrative game, a little bit like Horus Heresy, but um there is a you know, a, a growing tournament scene, and it's a game which does um, lend itself quite well to tournaments, um, but not the kind of super hyper competitive tournaments that you, that you might get with other games. Like, it's there's still a lot of kind of camaraderie and fun, certainly in my experience, which is retained um, on AT, which makes it a um, you know a great game if you're playing narratively or if you're playing it. Um, competitively um i have noticed there's been a bit of a drop off in the amount of like narrative um events i know tom stallard he does um one up in chichester every year i went to one of those a couple of years ago which was great fun and i don't know if it's maybe because tournaments are a bit easier to run than a narrative i think i think titanicus lends itself really well to tournaments um just because it isn't like cover war games like 40k for example where you have a tyranid army and a space marine army and those two things have two different profiles as well as then their faction specific rules right in titanicus it is generally engines versus engines and their base stat line is is nigh or nigh identical right so the only i guess alteration to whichever faction um or allegiance you choose is down to just like you know rules that modify either the titans themselves or like the gameplay experience but those rules i would argue aren't as like uh effective of the game as other war game rules again like 40k where you can have rules that can really shift the the balance of a game into titanicus i feel like they they are enough to make the individual factions feel distinct and different but they aren't so overpowering that um you know that there are clear defined 
uh, meta factions to go, right? Uh, meta legios to go. Uh, I think it shows itself quite well with uh, some of the top players of, of AT being able to switch up legios and still walk away with, you know, very high placings in tournaments just for the fun of it, right? Well, I think so a I lot think- a lot of it comes down to, like you say, it's... I can't remember. We sort of threw out a random percentage, but we, we kind of have always sort of said it's like 60% the Titans that you actually take and then maybe like 20% the mana pools that you select and then like 10% the rules that you take and the rest of it is just down to you, you being good at the game mm-hmm. um but a lot of that's why it's a perfect match play game because there are less of those roll dice feel bad moments um because your opponent generally has the same sort of odds that you do when when you roll dice right um yeah and you know exactly what they can do well most of the time there's always going to be exceptions to the rules right there's there's not as many gotchas as you get in some games or, or those sort of like they can do sort they can do what now uh moments mm-hmm. Um, there's still a few, especially when you start chucking in corruptions and stuff, and like my brain starts frying when I'm like, so, okay, so I want to just just speak to Dan from bottom of the barrel as to how I coped with his Vulturum list. It's like so that that's on a minus one uh, when when that happens in that scenario. Um, but if I'm here, then I'm getting extra shield damage and and what? Um, but but yeah, it's um, you can look at a Titan and go, I know roughly what that's capable of. Yeah. Um, I know what I can expect to come my way from that Titan within a, a good tolerance. And then there's just sort of like those extra little rules uh, on top uh, from the Legios, from the mana pools. Um, and again, even the mana pools, right, you sh- most people will know what a mana pool is capable of doing. It's only really yeah. when you get down to the Legio rules that the, it starts yeah. being a bit more... Yeah, even if you don't know that what a Ferox mana pool gives you know it's the oh the close range does more damage mana pool right yeah um so you know yeah i think i think it i think that's maybe why people are stepping away from distinctively narrative events because what's the point of putting the like effort into running a narrative event um when like the normal use for narrative event is to like take a uh, relaxing step away from the competitive scene um, and like run units that people don't necessarily always run and stuff like that. In Titanicus, again, you're you're going to be playing with the same models, doing the same stuff, um, whether you're playing narratively or or not. So why not put it in a structure that lends itself well to you know uh, a big multiplayer setting? Because um, the game itself, like, it has so many moments that that build narrative. Um, you know, I I find that you know from from toing and playing in tournaments that you watch people playing and no one is like sweating it out doing you know like you know dirty tricks or like just not talking to their opponent or whatever they're generally having a good time a good laugh um everyone gets excited when when stuff dies and like funny events go off like catastrophic chain explosions that you know are more common than you think um and a totally, you know, not fair, but even the person that has it landing on them loves it because it's just so ridiculous and, you know, and funny. Um, in 40k, you know, like you said, there's so many got or, or other war games, not just 40k. Um, there are so many got got your moments um, that it it can feel a bit disheartening when you do get stomped. Whereas if, if I get stomped a lot and I still have a, a great time playing, you know. And so, I, I think I think that's kind of evident as well by the fact that. Um, I've been to multiple tournaments where there's been multiple people who have said, look, this is like my third game of AT, um, you know, and they still have a great time. You know, OK, they're probably going to lose um, a few of those games um, because, you know, if, especially if you get matched up with a more experienced opponent. Um, but they still have a great time, you know, and, you know, I, I've, I've had that feedback a couple of times from new, well, from a few people at, you know, our beachhead events that people treat it as a way of getting in more games, especially if you're playing five games of, of Titanicus, like you might not get five games in, in a month, um, mm. of playing AT normally. Um, but you go to a tournament and, you know, as long as you know the basics of the rules, if you say to somebody at, 
any event that I've been to, you know, I'm a bit rusty on, I'm not quite, you know, so confident. Most people will turn around and say, all right, mate, well, let's roll some dice and I'll tell you kind of where you're going wrong or like what you need to do when everyone's really accommodating. Um, mm-hmm. But saying that, I would re- I would like to see a few more narrative games again. It's an area yeah. of this game that I've not really had much opportunity to to properly immerse myself in. Um, I think, you know, when we're out of tournament season, I, I think I'm going to be sort of, we've been talking locally about possibly doing a little bit of a mini narrative campaign um, with a few local players and sort of, um, especially now that the campaign compendium is, has been released, um, I'd quite like to experiment with some of those rules like the, you know, um, the, the rules where Titans can get experience or like are they persisted game over game, yeah. like all yeah. that sort of stuff. Um, something where there is kind of impact over multiple days. But again, um, that's the thing, right? It, it, that suits a, a smaller local scene that's able to put in, you know, possibly like weeks of of games spread out. Um, you know, whereas like a two day tournament, may, you may have leveling up between the days or between the games, but it's not going to be as streamlined or smooth, you know, smooth as, yeah. as that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, but whether or not you are a competitive player or if you are a you know more narrative gamer, um, everybody likes to win. And I guess a lot of what we're going to talk about um, today, um, it, although we're calling it kind of like um, how to play competitively, I guess, I, I guess a lot of this, um, what we're going to talk about is relevant to how you can make a list or how you can play a game and be you know be be competitive i keep hitting my mic tonight it's probably gonna be thumping all the time um I'm gesticulating too much with my hands um I'm too excited see yeah. you say you're not a competitive gamer but your arms are going all over the place yeah i, I know. start mentioning it i know i'm just getting excited but you know i mean we see a lot of lists <laughs> I've seen a lot of oh, yeah. a, a lot of different Lee Joes, um, so we thought this was a good opportunity, especially with the match play guide now being out for a few months. More events kind of under our um, sway that we would we would talk a little bit more about um, how to approach competitive games in a tournament setting or not, um, or let's let's just say matched play games where you know you mm. are setting rules, you are setting stratagem hands, and you are playing two objectives two specific objectives let's say either open war or from the the match play guide and and hopefully as well there might be a few little kind of tidbits in there that if you are thinking about um running your own event um some things to consider as a tournament organizer and and we've always said if you if you want to run an AT event but you don't really know where to start you know hit hit us up on maximalfire at gmail.com We'll more than happily send you over a copy of one of our event packs, and mm-hmm. you can use that um, as a springboard to um, sort of like, like a loose guidelines that you can use um, to help run your own events. Um, all we ask is just say, you know, provide our name uh, in it, pack provided with the assistance of Maximal Fire. That's all we. That's all we ask. But. Um, mm-hmm. We've waffled and we've talked a bit about events, but should we actually try and give people some... Let, let, let's actually sort of dig into it a bit more. This is going to be as uh, useful for me as uh, our audience, I feel. So I'm, I'm excited to pick your brain. Uh, I, I hope that we can uh, that, that it can live up. Uh, to that, I I probably should yeah, have got a few morsels. <laughs> I, I probably should have got Stu Oliver on uh, for this one. Mm. Um, you know, he's still undefeated um, at mm-hmm. tournaments, and uh, his list and theory crafting is is very good. Um, but you'll have to do with me. I have won an event, one event that I've won, um, and you know I've come fairly high in a couple. So hopefully, I'm not. Talking complete track. I've had a podcast for two years, so hopefully I've got an opinion. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. That'd be silly. No. Um, uh, no. <laughs> yeah, you would hope that by now that I know what I'm talking about, but who knows? Um, I, I, every day is a school day. <laughs> Where should we start? Oh, list building. 
the the beginning of the journey it's a competitive play list building literally the best bit of the experience i love list building yeah i mean i've um i got battle scribe on my phone and it's just mm. full of lists um i used to start calling them like graphonicus version one and i was like that ain't gonna work because i'm like what what on earth is graphonicus version two got in it that yeah <laughs> so now i've started trying to build them for specific events so like newcastle version one newcastle version two and like for this event that i'm prepping for in newcastle i think i came up with like three lists that i was considering running um all of which um <coughs> excuse me were kind of variations on a theme of what what i kind of was thinking about doing i think the, the number one thing when you're building a list is build something that you think you're going to have fun with you know mm. something that plays into your play style so if you like close combat you know you you hopefully pick the legio which is a close combat legio lean into that don't try and kind of like if, if you want to be competitive anyway don't try and kind of like put a a, a, a round peg in a square hole um you know for instance a vulper extergabus is probably not going to do as well as a vulper corsair or a vulper um ferox or something like that yeah um but the you will get more out of your games obviously if you are enjoying what it is you're doing mm. the, the next thing that you need to consider is how big of a game is it so 1750 is generally considered these days to be a normal sized match play game i know some places still use um, 1500 but those points generally increased to 1750 around about the time that we started getting war gear uh, from like the loyalist books um it means that you can add a little bit more diversity into your list you can take some heavier titans um and it gives you a little bit of flexibility to do what you want so i i've always found that the 1750 points is is, is a bit of a sweet spot uh, for at um but you know i've also been to events which were 1850 and um and 2000 and i know some places have, have kind of even even gone bigger but my personal favorite is is still 1750 um mm. i think that that offers you um enough points to build a list that's interesting to run um but also kind of doesn't start running away with everything and you start chucking the kitchen sink in just to kind of yeah. make up the points there'll always be some element of sacrifice at 1750 that you can't quite do what you want to do um but enough that you will still have a good hard-hitting list yeah. you can add like enough war gear to have a bit of fun with it without taking all the war gear on all the titans yeah yeah um, um, uh, yeah list building is it can be tricky because um when you're dealing with so few units with such high points values compared to like the the actual you know maximum points itself um i find it so much where i'm left with like an awkward number of points to have free so either there's like 100 150 points left over and it's like that's a lot of war gear that i might just be like wasting on you know just getting it for the sake of getting it because i've got the leftover points or yeah not or not quite enough to serastus knights points worth gonna you know yeah it's it's that really awkward spot me. isn't it between oh yeah i can afford three questorus knights or like two serastus knights that kind of around about a hundred points you can't really get anything um for that mm. for that and so if, if using that as an example at that point there if I'm finding myself, uh, and I have the luxury of having um, models to choose from, I would probably be looking at switching up my um, armament selection to try and either free up some points or to, um, to to better allocate that so I've got less sort of points. Because if you're running a standard size maniple and you've got 50 points left over at the end of the uh, day, well... Five Bastion Shields is, is 50 points. You know, something like that is kind of fine. But when you're sort of in that 75 to sort of 120 points, um, there's not a lot you can take, um, especially uh, unless you've already taken a Banner of Knights because 
the only night switch will fit into that is your armages. And for you to take armages, you need to already have another banner of knights uh, because of their retainer rule. So it's it's an awkward awkward spot. So yeah, I mean, if if I ever find myself in in that sort of situation, then I I would be looking at um at my weapon selections. Is is there anything that I can maybe downgrade which might give me a few more points to sort of take a you know two Serastus or or even you know a, a banner of Questorus? Um, or alternatively, is there any of my weapons I can upgrade to kind of close that gap? A little bit because I think you know you touched upon it earlier on. You don't really want to be wasting your war gear. Your war gear needs to um, it, it needs to serve a purpose to your list because what will happen is you will just likely forget about it. Um, you'll have too many things to track, too many bits of war gear to track. Um, it's especially if you're playing in a tournament scene. It's very hard to keep a track on everything anyway, um, and. And yeah, the, the the perfect moment to use that war gear will come along, and you'll miss it, um, unless unless you're just very good at kind of managing that sort of stuff. So I try and keep it simple, and I try and keep my war gear. Um, it, it has to fulfil a very specific purpose uh, in my list. the The only war gear really which I consider to be sort of like that throwaway war gear is is a bastion shield because. You'll, you're always going to use that. You're always going to push your shields at some point. Um, so it, it should be something that you should remember. Um, I think, though, that the, the main um, aspect of list building um, comes down to whether or not you're planning on hitting things hard or if you want to play to an activation advantage. Um Activation advantage is, is a big thing in tournaments. Um, you often see um, multiple demi maniples of like three titans. So like six activations is kind of quite common in tournament play. Um, but obviously you are generally leading uh, yourself into lighter titans at that point. Warhounds, Reavers, you might fit in a single warlord or something in in your list but generally speaking you're going to be much lighter um and so you need to make a decision if if you're going to go that way or if you're going to kind of double down on the hard hitting stuff and maybe look at things like extergamus because if if you're taking an extergamus you need to make up that um activation advantage by killing titans as quickly as possible mm. um can, and and what i see quite often um is that you have if, if you take a lot of titans in multiple maniples that also gives you multiple princeps traits um mm-hmm. and and that generally leads to a, a little bit of a well, let's say the dominance of dominant strategist um in in tournament play whether you like that ability or not i know it's a bit polarizing for some people um but having two princeps traits gives you a lot of versatility um and allows you to kind of make up for potential issues that your um your mana pool might have so if if you're a warhound heavy list in ordax for example taking something like ironclad tyrant on on your ferox mana pool will help you kind of continue to to pass orders um or like um you know, Reckless Maverick, if you're Griffonicus, um, f- f- gives you something completely different in that sort of once-per-game super go, uh, mm-hmm. so to speak. Um, but activation advantage, I think, is quite important. It, should be, it shouldn't be ignored, because any good player is going to um, look at their force and think, where's my sacrifice going to be? Because with, ac- with activation advantage, you know... You need to make sure that you're keeping that advantage for as long as possible, but you also mm-hmm. need them to focus on 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 what, or rather, they need to react to you. You need to make them react mm-hmm. to you. So, you use your activations in such a way that you can force your opponent to commit to something that they would rather commit later to. Um, be that a sacrificial warhound, which you push up on one side, 
make them react and then you've got multiple different activations of which you can then go okay you're done you're done with your three or four activations okay well i've got three or four more activations still to go so i'm just gonna have at it now um and start lining up those flank attacks or or what have you or kind of getting into those awkward positions especially if it's on the bigger heavier warlords so when you're building do think about um kind of what it is uh what, what your strength is um and um and whether or not you want to kind of double down on some of the heavier maniples or if you want them to go for for the lighter maniples there's there's certain maniples if you want to play which you really only get the benefit of with with the larger maniples um the regia for instance you know you have to take two warlords in a regia um if you're only going to take two warlords and, and one warhound then you're not getting a lot out of that maniple um that you would otherwise get um but maybe you're just taking that maniple of getting access to two warlords um, as someone who's historically played quite a uh, heavy maniple so you know full corsairs plus warlord or the the regio of my my tritonus um with you know kind of my my later takes on on uh building a my new um uh my new legio it's definitely gonna revolve around the um dual demi maniple play style because I, I the the bonus activations combined with the ability to whenever you're building a list, we're going back to the the um princeps traits right like whenever you're building a list the the big question for me at least is is my bgo specific strat uh seniorist trait better than dominant strategist right if it's not really you should take dominant strategist this lets you lean into whatever cool thing that your princeps seniorist can do uh while also having the competitive edge so to speak um with with dominant strategist itself um yeah having having just the even just being able to uh counter you know um careful play at the beginning of the game having more units to you know more or less impactful units to kind of bait out uh opponents activations is it's so good uh, i think it's displayed quite well in the bat rep you know with uh your uh Audax oh, versus yeah. my Tritonus, right? There is just the weight of activations. Um, you know, even if I was killing Titans a turn, it just it was it was too much to be able to deal with, especially in uh, a match play scenario which has massively lean lent into more objective based playing um, in recent years. You know, having to capture objectives, assigning. Alpha, beta, king, queen, spoon, fork, etc. Right? <laughs> like, <laughs> um, it it requires you to be able to have that fluidity to be able to um, complete your objectives, uh, and the more activations you have to do that, obviously, the the better. Yeah, and and on the subject of dominant strategist, like it, there are a lot of people who still don't like it, and I get it because it can be a bit of a gotcha. Um, but if you're taking like from what I've seen in tournament play, what what tends to be very common is if there is a do a demi maniple, you take your something cool or something useful on one of your princeps, and your second one takes dominant strategist in case you need it um, to avoid a charge or to get a charge in. Um, my tempestus list that I took to Swansea, um, I took a minimum myrmidon. No, not a myrmidon. Minimum mandatum. And um, a minimum ferox. No, not a minimum ferox. There was two reavers in the ferox, so it was just over minimum ferox. Um, and the way that I ran that was my ferox had the dominant strategist, and I took favoured by fortune on the mandatum uh, because I wanted my warlord to have a reroll because uh, he had a volcano cannon. So one dice, one hit. You want to try and maximise as much as possible that landing a hit. Um, and so with something like Favoured by Fortune, um, if you do have those single or low dice um, weapons on your princeps, 
you can kind of mitigate or rather improve their potential effectiveness. And you can even be then fishing for those sort of fives and sixes, um, you know, behind cover if, if needs to. Um, I think my cat's just come in to say hello, so she's probably going to like show her ass to everybody in a yeah. second. I'll try and keep her off the computer. Um, but um, but yeah, um, list building. Come on then, Tilly. Pick up. Show the cat. Show the cat. Come on. Show the cat. There's the cat. Oh, there we go. Hello. This is why people are here. This is why you need to watch on on YouTube rather than (laughs) on uh, uh, listen to us on um, um, pod. Although now, obviously, you can watch the video on Spotify. um, Yeah. But you you will miss um, being able to see. Uh, my my cat, who is a real pain in the ass, I'm just going to try and get rid of get rid of her. Where she'll probably now scratch at the door for ages. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, sorry to announce to everyone, or excited to announce to everyone that we are now a cat based podcast. Um, so if you have Titanicus, just you bet you better go. Yeah, well, you've got two dogs. Yeah. Okay. I grew up with cats, though. Oh, fine. <laughs> Fine, fair enough. It's kind of a special place in my heart. Um, so yeah. Anyway, back back to lists. So think think about what you're going to do. Are you going to take? Um, are, are you going to look to try and maximise your uh, princeps abilities and your activations, or are you going to double down with something heavy hitting or something like a fortis, which is just, you know, your your whole tactic is going to be sitting on objectives and, and not being moved. Mm. But if you are taking less, uh, make sure that you're really sort of thinking about your activations because more than ever you will need to be looking to try and focus down targets and and kill at least one titan a turn and and stop and sort of reduce that activation disadvantage that you would be on so i mean yeah. some maniples which do this really well obviously the furian's extergamus is just disgusting when you put some hunting or specs on it um that thing can easily uh take on sort of those larger maniples because it can kill stuff st- super quick um and the extergamus in general is pretty good for that um but it struggles when it gets close um if your opponent can kind of mitigate um your shooting in the first couple of turns get under your guns then you know an extergamus can become extremely vulnerable and especially if you've got if you are for instance um Tritonus, you know, Stygian Vale can easily kind of do that. and But unfortunately, that is something that you're never going to um, get around. And the this sort of leads me on to the next point, which I'm, we're going to talk about in around stratagems, is you, if you're playing competitively against the same list all the time and you know what you can do, you can obviously build your list specifically for playing that person. But mm-hmm. when you go to a tournament, you have to consider... Um, like an all comers um, approach, and if your list is like great against melee lists, but struggles against um, like heavy hitting or knights, you can guarantee that you will draw yourself against an extergamus or against a knight household. Like you oh, need, yeah. you need to make sure that you kind of have a list which can adapt itself. To certain mm-hmm. things, or if you are leaning heavily into, um, like Vulper, um, close combat corruptions, that you have taken the stratagems, um, <coughs> or mutations, which kind of double down on ensuring that you're, you're going to get that as as often as possible. Um, yeah. but there does sadly exist the anathema to to your list a lot of the time, combat legios. If you get drawn against Kratos, you're probably going to have a, a tough time of it um, yeah. because of the quake. Um, you know, likewise, um, if you've got like a, a Solaria um, Warhound list and you're taking a lot of Camellia line, Camellia line shrouding, and you draw yourself against um, uh, Furians, for instance, well, that minus one that you've spent all of your points on to. Uh, at long range is negated by their war gear so Mm -hmm. it's you you have to expect that probably the list that you don't want to play you will probably have to play um and so make sure that you if if you don't if you if you can stay 
relatively um, broad spectrum, um, it's 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 a good thing to kind of do. But that's not to discourage specific gameplay styles because I think with anybody with a combination of stratagem points, you can mitigate those any uh, anathema lists um, oh, yeah. that you have. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's there's the stratagems for uh, you know if your opponent is staying still or if titans are standing still. Uh, I'm trying to remember which one it is. Earthshaker Mines? But, or is it the, the Quake? It's like a variant of like Cursed Earth, right? Or something like that, where if uh, if Titans uh, remain stationary, they... Oh, what is it? But e either way, right? Okay, so there, there are stratagems that, that combat both, you know, fast-moving um, lists and also stationary gun line lists as well. Yeah, um, I mean the the one that I was uh, think like if if you come across a fortis, they want to stay next to each other, you know, mm -hmm. that they, they are asking for something like I think is it Earthshaker mines or Quake shells or something like that, where yeah. you know you you hit them and then they get moved d six in a random direction and can potentially mm -hmm. then be causing kind of collisions on their own titans, um, but again, and this this kind of moves into the next point, you can never. Your stratagem hands now are set at the beginning of tournament mm -hmm. play. So you cannot rely on having a perfect set of stratagems for a perfect opponent. So before, you just picked them before each game, and you could go, okay, well, I'm playing a combat list this time, so I'm going to have to put in, uh, you know, I'll put in a Vox Blackout, I'll put in a Thermal Mines, um, you know, I'll, I'll I'll chuck in some um, cursed earth because he's not going to be shooting at me. I'll be shooting at him a lot. You can do those kind of things, um, and because it's now set, you have to um, consider how your stratagems will be useful for a, a, a wide variety of um, of different opponents. So, mm -hmm. yeah. what will you get the most mileage out, and what what will you use every single game? Um, and and what do you need to keep up your sleeve as a what if scenario? Mm. Um, so the obvious one for like that I take every single time is I will always take a Vox Blackout up up my sleeve. Like again, it's another one of those sort of feel bad strats. But now that it's it's public in your stratagem hand, um, since they changed that those rules, it's it's obviously less of a gotcha because they know you've got it. Then they yeah. know that they have to consider that if they're lining up a massive charge, that that turn you might hit them. Likewise, I know that a lot of events ourselves included up until now have always said that um, you know you can still use turn one stratagems if Fox Blackout is is played. I am considering kind of from from our perspective just going back to the rules as written on that because I think in in a situation if if your entire strat hand is made up of turn one um stratagems so you know your overcharge cannon your experimental weapon your um th then you're kind of asking to be turn one vox blackout and and i don't think that that is i don't think that the player playing that against you should be penalized i think that it's it's one of those situations where rules is written that does that would stop those activations but you should not put all of your eggs into into one basket with your stratagems, and you shouldn't um, expect that um, your opponent should just let you play how you want to play, because mm. they will try and do, and rightly so in competitive play, they shouldn't just sit back and let your Vulpa charge you. You know, they yeah. should they should be allowed to play a Vox Blackout to stop that all important charge, and that might annoy you um, mm. as a Vulpa player, but in in a competitive format um you know you, you you need to have that option you can't just let people do it yeah. and so you know i diversify like, it and if, make if you're, if you're like me and you run an all melee vulpa list like you cannot get like fucking sad if someone plays a, a vox blackout against you because you are essentially asking for it right like that's that's a, a meme fun list but if you're trying to be as competitive as possible and yet you still run all melee all melee mutations you're you know 
you're joking yourself. <laughs> yeah, and, and this <laughs> is why you need to be careful. Right. You know, if, if that is how you're you're um, running your list, you you need to be careful, and you need to anticipate that that might happen against you. So, mm-hmm. what's what's your plan B? And the same with your stratagems. Like, you should have a this is what I intend to use most games, but what's my plan B? What what do I have if I don't come across that situation or I don't come across that lead game? Which is why selecting things which can be versatile against most people is generally going to be better than a hyper specialized list of stratagems, albeit in some very unique circumstances. Now, I don't want this to kind of. It sound almost sounds like we're kind of going a little bit down a win at all costs type um, mentality, and I want to make sure like that that should be discouraged, right? Uh, you know, we are talking about kind of like making sure that you've got these tricks up your sleeves and stuff for this sort of stuff, but you know, the important thing is that you and your opponent both have fun, um, and so don't be a complete dick about it, um, but. When you are taking your stratagems, there's a lot of the the certain the, there is a reason why, you know. And we saw this after Beachhead, you get um, people taking similar stuff. Concealment barrage, always useful. You know, yeah. if if you if you are your if you are a Vulper um, player and you have come across Krytos, then you can guarantee yourself, or as near to guarantee yourself, getting at least one of your Titans into close combat by using Concealment Barrage defensively and yeah. moving your Titan into the Concealment Barrage rather than trying to stop a line of fire from somebody else. Like, I, I've what I've done often is you um, full stride a Titan in the combat, in the movement phase, you move them into or be, as best as you can behind the um, the Concealment Barrage and then in the combat phase, as late on in that activation as possible... You would then, you know, move your um, full stride out of it so you're lined up for turn two, and sometimes all it takes in, in a list like that is is one Titan getting into melee to to completely break the line down, um, which then frees you up for subsequent turns, um, <coughs> and the same for like the Extergamus. You know, how can you slow your opponent down? Like you, you might need to con- seriously consider ways that your stratagems will help slow your opponent down, so they're not getting under your carapace range. You know, maybe you take some scatterable mines or something to add big areas of the table into dangerous terrain. Um, you know, or maybe you are you you, you punish people for um, for moving, like by taking things like thermal mines. You know, potentially you might be able to cripple somebody. Um, leaving them exposed in the middle of the table through some clever use of stratagems. Um, but I, 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 I'm, I'm going to kind of um, read out the lists that I've been sort of looking at here. So um, what I took um, to Swansea and my 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 hand for Swansea, um, it was 2K, so it was eight stratagems, six points that we could use. Um, in this instance here, I took the, t- the Tempestus Combat Drop as one, uh, a useful legio specific but very expensive um ability and i think often the really good ones tend to be expensive you know your um civilization's ruin is expensive for krytos um your um what's it called surge stitch and vale. vales expensive Three, SP. yeah the 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 um surge for furians i forget the full name of it is is expensive um but you know, it it will you'll get some mileage out of it if 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 you play it right. So I took I took that three points, um, and then I took Vox Blackout, uh, which was another three points. So although I could, it was very unlikely that I would be playing both of those stratagems in one for, in, in one game. Mm. Um, the idea being there is that if I'm playing um, a an objective or um, I need to get deep into the table for whatever reason. I would I would combat drop. Um, however, if I was expecting a heavy charge against me, or or even kind of things like you know I was facing an extergamus and I knew that they were all going to try and um, first turn first fire 
against me to try and drop drop some shields early on, you can you can chuck that Vox Black out out to sort of stop that. But it would never be very rare, very unlikely. I was going to use both. Um, and then I like to take a couple of one point stratagems um, and and a handful of twos. So I took. Um, obviously concealment barrage for the reasons i've already um said and because i ran them as loyalist tempestus um i had access to a couple of situational or um maneuver uh, stratagems so i took the long retreat which is one point allowed me would allow me to reposition um really quickly if i needed to against an opponent or if i needed to try and get around somebody um iron resolve um, I also took that. Um, works very nicely with Tempestus's ability to try and um, destroy Titans when they die themselves because you have to mm-hmm. pass a command check um, and then you get to fire a weapon back and the amount of times that that paid dividends for me is it was a lot. Um, but also, if you fail an important charge, Iron Resolve, you've got it there. You can pass that order and carry on. Um and then sort of the the rest you can kind of pick and choose. I like I like a sabotage, just kind of like a a vox blackout light, so to light, speak. Yeah. Um because you can chuck that at a charging Titan and you might you're not gonna stop everybody, but if if like you've got said Vulper bearing down on you, it's gonna be a big old long charge, chuck a sabotage on him. Okay, one in six, uh he might still get a charge order off, but yeah. one in one in six, you might shut the Titan down. And exactly. the worst case, well, other than that, the other four um, things on the um, list is you're either going to full stride him, in which case he's not going to be doing any attacking, um, or he's going to be crippled somehow, like a first firing um, mm. Vulpo is, is not going to do a lot, probably. Um, and... Even things like with the split fire, you know, moving, um, being forced to keep within your front arc. Um, so I, I like a little bit of a sabotage. Um, but when it comes to tournament play, I'd always recommend that you take at least one tertiary objective. If you want to yeah. play competitively and you want to make sure that you're kind of winning games, um, then like the de facto go to on tertiary objectives is a score to settle. Um, and that scores you an additional victory point for every enemy unit that's been destroyed. And if you know that you're not going to fulfil your secondary objective, sometimes that's enough to get you the same amount that you would have lost or or possibly a few more. Like I said earlier on, when I played in Swansea, I won a game based on the fact that I played that and it pushed me a few yeah. points over based on kills. Um, so always having a um, that... To be fair, like the best one is a score to settle. It's one point. You can hold it up your sleeve. Um, but obviously remember that you can't spend the points earlier on. So you need to Yeah, I I would always try to, but if obviously shit goes to hell in a handbag, then maybe you need to throw out and forget about that and just try and win yeah. through conventional means rather than holding out for an extra three or four points at the end of the game. Um so yeah, I think that's stratagems. I think that's Pretty stratagems. Summary of stratagems. Yeah, yeah. I, I re- think um, yeah. I I I like tertiaries. I think it was the only reason I did half as well with my Volpa list at the uh, the one and only tournament <laughs> I did bring it to. Um, was was purely down to to tertiaries. Uh, that was using the old rules, but even in the when I TO'd our our latest um beachhead, the what really separated the top half of the leaderboard from the bottom half of the leaderboard was those that had brought tertiary objectives and were able to, because it's not even helping you in the games that you were playing necessarily, but as an overall score modifier, if you and a load of other people are on one win and two losses, the bonus tertiary points that you have managed to secure to get you up to that, that secondary limit, are going to make the difference between you being at the top of the one lit win two losses and the bottom of the yeah it might it, it might be the difference of a placement like yeah. uh, when when I look at the Swansea um, event um, other than first place everybody had lost a game so the the difference between me placing third or coming fourth I think was within 
five or six victory points. Mm. You know, and if I'd have played a score to settle another go, gotten a few more, who knows? You know, I might have still placed even though I lost. Um, yeah. But it, it's it is it, it's it's very good. It, it definitely helps, and it's often overlooked um, from the tertiaries. And I like how that they've incorporated tertiaries into the secondary scoring in the match play guide. Mm. But more than anything, I really like the um, the open stratagem hand. Like mm-hmm. if, if you're playing match play guide or you're playing open engine war, that is an upgrade to the game, which just makes the whole quality of life of AT better for both your opponent and for you, knowing in advance. Um, and sometimes you can play some mind games there. Like I've taken Vox Blackout. Will I use it? Won't I use it? Yeah. Um you know, even if you've got no intention of using it, chuck it in your strategy and make them think what, how, how you might use that. Um, mm-hmm. It's 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 a really good um, addition to the game, and it also massively speeds up tournament play. Like when we went to our tournaments last year, when we ran it in the summer and in Beachhead, like between every single game, you had to think about what stratagems you were going to take, and that adds more time, more setup time. Whereas this is like, here's my list, here's my princeps abilities, here's my um, stratagems, off we go. And and, and it's as, as simple as that. Which I think is why it's become more prevalent to have um, a all-rounder list recently because of that fixed and open strat hand. Mm. Whereas before you could get away with leaning into a certain kind of play style, now you're a bit more of a risk doing that you Um, you are yes i think certainly in match play at the moment you are kind of forced to have a bit more of a an all comers um Mm -hmm. list um because to your point before they introduced this you could just take whatever you needed against your opponent um and that was you know generally it was fine um but this, to a large extent, removes a lot of those gotcha moments. It's like, ha-ha, I'm playing a Vox Blackout. Now it's like, oh, yeah, I kind of expected that because I knew you had it in your list. Um, but it, it does add a whole new aspect to um, to list building. I, I'm trying to take something slightly different to Newcastle. Um, I've learned some lessons after my um, last event, and interestingly, kind of looking at it, I'm now in a position where probably a good chance that i might not end up using all of my strategy points in one uh in certain games because i've tried to kind of be a bit more versatile like i've never really played against knights before and the fact that you lose out on strategy points against knights is a big deal like uh, at 1750 you're getting three points so i've chucked static rain in there now just in the event that i can um I, I come across one of those, and, and that ability for one turn, every knight unit within twelve inches cannot make an ion save, and that brings you, But that brings you. It's expensive, and it's only one round. But that means that now your Vulcan Mega Bolters are likely to hurt because mm-hmm. they're not getting their ion shield saves against Vulcan Mega Bolters, and you're fishing for nines, so you can just chip away um, at that damage against them. So I, I've chucked that in there. Um, Vox Blackout is still in there but then i've taken a few other slightly different ones concealment barrage is still in there because of course it's not a score to settle is still in there and then the rest of it i'm kind of messing around with cursed earth i'm going to be taking probably an extergamus to this one so i'm thinking being able to drop their shields quicker is Mm. probably going to be a benefit giving away all of my tactics of stuff that i'm going to be at the newcastle event here so if i lose yeah if i lose it's because people knew what i was doing um I'm going to give Titan Hunter Hunter Infantry a go, I think, as well. Oh, okay. So just just trying to kind of mix it up a little bit and try something different. And again, another way of trying to drop shields so the Extergamus can can do some damage. And I'm I'm taking my Graphonicus, so it's a predominantly Reaver um, Mm. Extergamus. So it lacks some of the heavy-hitting firepower of the um, Warlord while still being fairly competitive. Mm. I think we're nearly there. I think we just got to touch yeah. on some objectives um, before um, we wrap up. Mm. So, objective play is a big part of. Uh, well, it was mostly introduced with Open Engine War, um, and then it was mm-hmm. kind of you know developed on um, for match play, and um, 
I, th- I think Open Engine will very much kind of lent itself to objectives, which meant that your your exterminuses and that sort of stuff were a bit of an, a disadvantage for most um, most of those missions. Whereas now, the way that the missions are in the match play, there's a bit more kind of there's, there's a few more things. yeah, there's a few more viable options. You know, hold the line, make sure stuff doesn't come within twenty four inches of your um, board edge. Very good for a gun line. Um, mm. Defend and extract similar kind of move those um t- uh those objectives behind your big titans hold them um and then there's the flip side of that you know you push forwards for your fast legios get up the board you know get up there and do what you need to do um but you always need to consider your um objectives and a, and a mistake that i see a lot of people make is that they don't know what they're going to take before the game they haven't given any thought to how their legio is going to play certain objectives. Mm-hmm. So most most events will be either three or five um, uh, mission uh, games in length, and um, a lot of people are adopting the objective pool um, rules from the match play guide. So that is, you have access to all of the objectives. Um, you choose one and use it, and if once you've used it, you can't use it again. So each game has to use different primaries and secondaries. It's like chalk them off, scratch them off, play something different. But there's certain combos which work better with one another and there's certain objectives which work better with certain deployments. So every event should give you a um, a rules pack. Most of the time they'll set a um, deployment per game. So think about what do you want to play on this. You can't obviously choose what your opponent's going to do but you can have an idea what you're going to do what's your legio good at have a look at the objectives pair them off against secondaries which will lean into how you are going to play that particular game for instance um there is um push forwards um and uh deny them which is what i used in swansea if you can get your print if you if you can keep your princeps alive by the end of the game and get that princeps titan within eight inches of your opponent's board edge you've immediately scored 25 victory points for your primary and nine for your secondary and mm. you, you can do things to kind of lend uh, to, to, to support you for doing that but that's a that's a good pairing it's a good combo even better is vital cargo and deny them because you can physically take that model off the board and he doesn't count as being destroyed so he doesn't even need to last the whole game but therein is a reason why a lot of events at the moment are restricting vital cargo and retrieval because both of those objectives in particular are very easy to score maximum points on turn two and there's nothing your opponent can really do about it. They're kind of seen as being a bit too easy to win with. So a lot of events are saying, I'm not going to, I'm going to do the, the pool, but I'm going to remove vital cargo and I'm going to remove, um, um, what was it called? <laughs> File cargo and uh, retrieval, retrieval. Um, from the list. Um, they're, they're, they're good fun. I, d- I did that against my game um, with Johnny at Beachhead. I had um, Vital Cargo because it was one of the first we'd done with the match play before we kind of thought maybe this needs to be considered. Um, but yeah, I, t- I took that and I took Deny Them. Turn two, my Princeps was on his board edge and I took him off. And... There was nothing he could do about that now. I, I had scored 34 uh, objective points on turn two. And then my other, yeah, my other guy just had to survive the rest of the game uh, for me to mm-hmm. score maximum points. I mean, I was obviously at a disadvantage because I was a Titan down. It's kind of no different to losing a Titan early, um, but better in, in some yeah. respects. So go into your um, um, events having thought about the objectives that you're going to pair off against each other. Things like um, particularly um, aggressive um, missions like push forwards, where you need to get within your opponent's um, you know, certain distance from your opponent's board edge. Maybe couple those up with things like um, would deny them, or maybe the the one where you've got to kill your opponents. I forget what it's called. Wrath, it used to be Wrath and Ruin in um, yeah. open, open play, but you know, kill a percentage if you're opponent um <coughs> and um and for your defensive ones do you know do the same like maybe maybe if you're doing hold the line that's the one where you you, you take the the secondary with the um 
the sword and shield alpha and beta uh, where one titan's got to kill something and the other person's got to survive um but try and go in with a plan think about your deployment think about the objectives that you've got available to you and what are you going to use when and play to your plan don't yeah. play to your opponent's plan it's 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 something i see a lot is that um i mean sometimes you just have to react if you play against knights your plan is out the window like you have just got to deal with this wall of knights which is running towards you Mm -hmm. but the moment that your opponent otherwise in normal night game gets them to do gets you to do what they want you to do you've probably lost already yeah so stick to your plan well We've gone from 45-minute podcasts to back up to probably another hour and a half of here, Johnny. <laughs> so much to talk about, isn't there? There is. It comes to you. And I like the sound of my own voice. Competitive play. Well, you know, you are, I am so goddamn trash at the game. So <laughs> you are the, the authority on the, on this one. Hey, I, I, I'm here to have a good time and run, you know, I, silly I, list. I yeah. think I think your problem, Johnny, is you're just too polite at AT. Really? And I, and, and and that sounds like a, another whack attitude, right? Uh, but but you know you got to be a bit ruthless, especially as a Vulper player. Know. You know, as a, know. you can't you can't be a nice Vulper player. Like I know, I know. Well, yeah. Hopefully, my um my next Legio, I'll try to be a bit more nasty and competitive with um. Yeah, we'll but I see, think eh? I think the important definition to make here is that you can be competitive mm. without being a horrendous opponent to play against. Yeah, you know the the most important part of this game is is having fun, and if you come out if you completely school your opponent, and you walk away with that um, with a high. Um, player experience points or however your um mm-hmm. tournament is tracking it you know um best sporting award you know or good sporting award for, um points however you're tracking it a lot of places do one to ten then you're doing something right you know it's mm-hmm. um a lot of people play at because it's fun you know even when you are dying and blowing up it's fun and sometimes obviously it's disappointing if you've done if you've done really well your first couple of games you obviously start sniffing the the placement and then to lose in your last game can yeah. be really disappointing. But, you know, it is it is a game at the end of the day. Um, it's possible, more so in this game, it's it's possible to be competitive but still give your opponent a really good time um, mm-hmm. compared to, to other games where, you know, you might as well just rip up your score sheet and walk off. Yeah. This isn't a game that is necessarily decided in the first turn or two. Um, which I think is why losing is a bit more fun. In, and, in and, and you do sometimes you just need to dig in, you know, mm-hmm. and 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 sort of shit in your pants and swim a little bit because mm-hmm. there's you can still set you can often salvage, um, you know, a good placement, a good score, even a draw, even a win, out of what mm-hmm. seems like a catastrophic first few turns. And that was certainly the case with me uh, when I played Ollie uh, losing stuff really early making some serious mistakes i made so many mistakes against him but i just kind of i was like okay i just need to change what i'm doing here uh and i was able to salvage that victory like i say i don't really think i deserved the win i think he deserved to win that he played better than i did but Mm. you, you just don't kind of give up there's always something to be salvaged back yeah that's the game and it's it's random enough to where you can be you know eating shit but pull it back yeah um, but not so random that you know you're you're risking your army every time you roll the dice you know what i mean like there there is enough you know there is there is enough of uh like a normal uh, normalized like uh situations where you know you would expect this to go down and 90% of the time it does go down, but there is like that 10% where you actually do kill your opponent's Titan with your um, Ardex defense lasers or... You know, like, like we you know saw. I mean? like, like, that would have happened twice, did it? 
in Might that game we uh, played. If you haven't seen the uh, the last battle uh, report we did, um, yeah, like stuff like that can happen. Um, and it's funny, even if you're the recipient, I bet, you know, I hope you found it funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, like we always joke that our decks defense lasers do nothing and then they kill two yeah. times. 90% of the time, you, you well, 100% of the time for me, I forget to use them. And then the one time I do and it kills two, uh, two Warhounds. Yeah, so, and not... Even when you lose in a scenario like that, you still walk away with that cool story about yeah, like, like you never believe yeah. what happened in my game. That was so that was crazy. Like, yeah, um, it's the only game where cat, you know, you can have like these chain reaction, catastrophic meltdowns. Um, if you told that to a, a competitive gamer of uh, you know any other of war game, you know, oh yeah, if I killed your guy, there's a chance that your guy would blow up and kill a load of your other guys. They'd be like, oh my god, that was like a horrible system to have in a uh, competitive game but it it meshes and works really nicely if you're a fortitus player you kind of want that to happen red sky yeah. is that bad boy mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, yeah exactly you know make things explode more override signal and uh and red skies make him go nova like you know even my tempestus i get a i get a benefit from dying you know yeah. and you know or potential benefit from dying and it, it does kind of soften that blow and it's it's really satisfying like the game i played against ben um, he, the first two shots of the game from his warhounds, he killed two warhounds. Mm -hmm. I, I, I started the game uh, on my activation, losing two warhounds in the first turn, uh, and then I returned fire and did nothing. But then, you know, he killed another one of my guys, and then I killed him back, and then that his titan then went nova and took out three of his titans. Like, and all of a sudden, the balance completely it's swung. Neck neck. Yeah. yeah. And 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 that's what I'm saying. Like you know, even when things seem lost, there's always a chance. Um, and and don't lose sight of that objective because if you the moment you forget about your objective, then that's probably where you're going to end up with like a a zero victory points. Like there's always something to be salvaged. Play to your objective. Try your best to hold it off. Sometimes it'll be unavoidable, but try um, to you know push push your titan that little bit further get to your opponent's board edge don't lose sight of that exactly i think it's very easy um from experience you know when you when you know you're losing and it's like you go to panic mode it's like okay how can i just react to what's happening in front of me when it's like no actually just let it happen obviously you know do the best you can to mitigate the damage and deal damage back but if you've got that objective in the middle of the field your focus shouldn't be trying to counter whatever's going on because if you're thinking about that, you've you've already lost the situation at hand because you're panicking. Just just go for the points, go for the objective. Um, yeah, especially in competitive play, if you lose the game but you make the the margin of a uh, VP a lot sh smaller, that will help you in the long run for the uh, the tournament itself. Yeah. So, you know, you can get to situations where it might be the best thing to actually ignore. The four warhounds that are shooting your titans in the back because you're gonna lose and there's no way you can turn your warlords around to kill them before they get you so I, that's just and and in that situation you think how can i salvage this okay i'm just gonna push that reactor as hard as possible mm -hmm. make sure i'm in the the are uh, the yeah. red so that by the time that they inevitably kill me there is a good chance that he's exploding and if I'm he explodes yeah I'm, I'm hopefully gonna kill some other things that always look for mm -hmm. those situations and there's there's almost like an element of triage in those situations. Mm. Like, what can I control? What can't I? And if you can't control it, don't worry about it. Like, mm. try 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 and focus on on where you can make the difference, mm. um, and and don't give up. Really. Yeah. If you are if you are a fellow sweaty goblin like myself who plays Magic <laughs> the Gathering, there is a a common phrase which is life is a resource, right? Like, if you're having to sacrifice titans to to get vp that's 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 dead titans well spent you know um you can even put that as far as um as stratagem points as well i think one point for a tertiary is yeah why wouldn't you right what's a uh what's an upgraded uh plasma cannon gonna do for you um you know if you can just get the extra yeah is, is that gonna score you an extra five victory points might do yeah might, yeah but, but is it it might help that that journey, but when you can actually just spend a strategy point and get those five points anyway, it's like, well, you know. I'm I'm really the, one of the reasons that I want to get into 
a bit more kind of like campaigny sort of narrative um side of AT is I want to see how that changes the game. Mm. Would I care more? Would I be more cautious as a player? Um because I think like I think your competitive players are, are quite um aggressive in how they play. You know, they'll they'll try and close down gaps quickly, um, you know, close the distance, get within twenty would you play more cautiously if you knew that there was an actual consequence um, to to a narrative? I d- I don't know. Okay. No, no, hell no, <laughs> hell no. Right? Like I don't. You know, that's not someone that really pay- plays super cautiously anyway. But like, it's narrative. You're there to have a bit of fun. You know, if you, your Legio is is you know, the the less cautiously the you play, the more stories there are going to be to tell, and that is. Quite literally, the purpose of a narrative. Yeah, event, right? no, you're, you're exactly story. right. You're exactly right. No, nobody remembers the games where nothing happened, mm-hmm. and you both you both basically just fired a few shots across the table. Uh, one and a, and a titan maybe walked around and fell down, but didn't really do much else than that. Like the games that you remember are the games with lots of explosions, the games where you end up killing a ton of your own stuff. Mm. Um, that you accidentally don't realise that you've already pushed that um, Titan a bit too close to the the orange, yeah. and then you've put, you've declared that you're firing a weapon. It's like, all oh, right, well now I'm going into the orange. Then, whoops, <laughs> yeah. forgot about that. You're, you, you're ending the game six to thirty five, but everyone was around the table in the final turn of the game, like laughing and cheering. You know, that's that's the kind of stuff you you know you, you really want. Um, Absolutely, I think that's yeah. And it's important, important that you don't lose game. don't lose sight of that. And and being a a humble winner is is the most important skill in this game. Mm-hmm. Play, playing the game well is is all very well and good, but winning well and winning with modesty, let's just say, is is an incredibly um, mm-hmm. admirable quality. And like I say, if 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 you can completely table somebody and they've still got a massive shit-eating grin on their face at the end of it, then you know that it's been a good game. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So do let us know uh, kind of what you thought about today. A little bit different from our usual content. Uh, Like I say, we are kind of in full tournament mode at the moment. So we are, certainly me, I'm kind of living and breathing um, all of this stuff at the moment. And, you know, it's, it's always nice to come home with trophies um but uh that's not what the game is all about at the end of the day but it's nice and uh i need to try and play I, I, my mission is to place in a couple of weeks so let's let's see how i do in in um in newcastle i'm going up with johnny from battle bling um long old drive bit of a, a road trip um and yeah go, it was it was great when i was up there in september last year so i'm hoping for a, a repeat um experience yeah, yeah. Um, and if you are looking for a, um, a and, and let's be honest, this, our June event is going to be a proper casual kind of tournament. Really, it's only one day, three event, um, three games, um, open to people of all uh, um, abilities. Um, you know that is, uh, if you want to cut your teeth um, or just get yourself a couple of uh, of games in, perfect opportunity to come down to pool. And um, and buy yourself a ticket to to that tournament, and you never know, you might walk away with some prizes. You know um, it's going to be chill because I might be playing. Well, I wouldn't be playing if it wasn't going to be chill. There we go. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, do check it out. Details are in the uh, in the comments. But um, hope you've all enjoyed it today. Please do remember that if you haven't done so already, give us a like and subscribe on YouTube if you're watching us there, or if you're um, listening to us on. Um, Spotify or um, on Apple Podcasts, you know, give us a five star. Um, f- give us five stars and leave us a review. Both is That's great. Either yeah. either or is is great. Um, we're obviously, I know it's been a little bit slow on the content um, side of things, but uh, we're hoping to pick that up again. I've I've spent thousands of pounds doing up my garage, so I'm hoping that that will give us another opportunity for a, a venue to to do some bat reps on sort of so we're not always having to do it around yours johnny um yeah that would be uh yeah um but yes that might still be a little bit of a way off because um i've got to at the moment it looks like a murder shed 
Um, <laughs> it needs to be appropriate for. It looks like something out of Dexter. You know, like you can imagine loads of shrink bubble wrap and stuff, kind of. Oh yeah. Around the tables when the, it's not full of models. So just just before we go, um, I do want to quickly um, give one big shout out um, to our friends at Loon Constructs. Um, they are new on the market, uh, providing um, grim dark terrain stuff printed. Um, Doug's an excellent chap. Um, he his um, his quality of his stuff that he's he's shown me is amazing, and um, it's really good value. Um, if you're in the UK, do check out Loon Constructs. He's also very, very kindly donated a ton of Grimdark Terrain uh, to ourselves, which we are going to be using for a, hopefully, if I, I don't fall afoul of the, um, the legals and terms and conditions, I want to do a raffle uh, to raise some money for charity, uh, as, as we've been doing for, uh, for the Motor Neuron Disease Association. Um, and he's given us a... a literally a ton of, of grimdark terrain to to give away as part of that raffle so once i've got my head around the terms and conditions and and made sure that i'm not going to get done for breaking any gambling rules or anything weird <laughs> yeah, like this in, in australia we have to give them like a what color is the sky kind of question just for it to be legal I, i'm not i'm I not sure sh- the... i thought oh, it was a great idea it'd be super easy and then i, I started no. talking to people and i was like yeah you just make sure you do this otherwise you know you can be sued and i was like okay i'm just trying some to do it yeah, yeah i I'm, I'm just trying to raise some money for charity here um but yeah, yeah i am i am i'm determined to make it work somehow um and i'll be looking at an opportunity to um to raffle off um all of this stuff um that doug's given us so do check out loon constructs um for all of your grim dark terrain needs and if there's nothing on uh if, if, if there's something specific that you're after which isn't on the website maybe drop him an email um they they've been going a number of months now but i believe their catalog is still being um, built up on on the website so get in touch with them see if they can print it for you i highly recommend it um i'll, I'll also drop the details of them in the uh, in the description below um so yeah i think that's it for today um big old it's good it feels good to be doing a, a bit more of a long one again i think we're probably pushing two mm. hours at this point but um we're not not rushing are we yeah this doesn't happen very often should probably happen more often but absolutely but hopefully the we'll stars are going to start we'll aligning um yeah i'm going to do one more shout out a lot of you have been asking about um, the law videos that we've been doing. So on YouTube, we we did a series of law videos. Um, absolutely intend to do more. I've got the scripts written up for Metallica and Vulturum, which I plan on doing next. Um, if you want some short, bite-sized information regarding the law of certain legios, do check out our, our YouTube. There's stuff on there for Audax, Solaria. Um, no, I'm not on Volpia, I don't think. Uh, um, no, I'm- Midway through doing Volpa. Yeah, Audax, Solaria, uh, Mortis, Tempestus, um, Ignatum, and, and, and a few more. Oh, Krytos uh, are all up there. Just short, bite-sized law videos, and I hope to be adding more of those soon as my schedule becomes a bit less hectic. Um, but yeah, um, thank you very much for staying with us tonight, guys. Good to be recording again, Johnny. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, do join us again next time, and always remember to go big, Go loud and go maximal.